Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, briefing. Um, my name is Inge Heyer. I am one of the deputy press officers for the American Astronomical Society. And before we get going, um, I would like to remind everyone uh, of the press dinner tonight. Directions are at, can be found in the press room at the mailboxes. And if you want to go as a group, we'll meet in the hotel lobby. That's the one on the second floor at 6 p.m. Uh, to go via subway. So, please join us for that. Now, first, just the usual um, airplane announcement, if, or movie announcement. If you have any devices that make noise, cell phones, etc., please put them in silent mode uh, for speakers and also later for anyone asking questions. Please always make sure you speak into the microphone so that the folks on the webcast can hear what's going on. All the speakers will speak in order, and then afterwards we'll take questions. If anyone on the webcast experiences any sort of technical problems, please let us know uh, via the web chat. Today, our topic is galaxies across the spectrum. We will first hear from Reinhard van Veren of the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics on, well, I guess what you could call cosmic train wrecks. Uh, colliding galaxy clusters which act as accelerators of particles. Next, we will hear from Harry Teplitz of the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center, Caltech, on ultraviolet imaging of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which has previously been uh, seen in other wavelengths, is now been observed in the ultraviolet to understand the f uh, stages of formation of very hot, massive young stars. Following this, we will hear from Roy Kilgard of Wesleyan University on black hole X-ray binary populations in M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, we see pairs of objects, one of which is an X-ray source, and we'll find out what happens with that. And finally, we will hear from Marco Aiello uh, of Clemson University on the cosmic evolution of Fermi BL Acerte objects. And, uh, basically plays ours. So, if, uh, right now, if you could take it away. Yes, yeah, so it's great to be here. Uh, so, I will be talking about some very uh, deep Chandra and um, VLA observations of, uh, of a particular galaxy cluster, a very interesting galaxy cluster. Uh, so, first, some background. So, galaxy clusters are large um, concentrations of galaxies, so up to a, typically a few thousand galaxies for a very massive cluster. Um, they're also the, really the most massive bounce objects we can find in the universe. Um, it's also very important to note that besides galaxies, there is clusters are filled with a very hot gas, so 10 to 100 million degrees hot gas. And you can see this in the image here. So here you have an, on, the, on one side you have an HST image, which actually shows just the galaxies, and on the other side you have a Chandra image, which basically shows the hot gas. And interesting is that actually the mass in the gas is a factor of 10 times higher than what is in the galaxies. So, um, it's a very important component. So how do actually galaxy clusters for, form? So galaxy clusters form basically by collisions of smaller clusters and galaxy groups. And when these clusters collide and eventually merge, they form a bigger cluster. Um, this is actually a very slow process. So it takes like a billion years roughly for, um, for two clusters to merge. And um, for the galaxies, actually, most of the galaxies during merge actually just fly past each other. Not so much happens for them but the gas in the cluster collides and uh, gets shock heated. So one example of a very interesting and really extreme merging galaxy cluster is the cluster uh, Max J0717. This is basically a, a merger of four different uh, clusters. And um, we can see here an HST image where uh, four of the components uh, are identified, A2D. This is an earlier uh, study uh, carried out in 2009. And what is interesting, this is really one of the most massive clusters we know of and also one of the most complex mergers with, uh, that we know of. Radio observations of this cluster in the past actually revealed the presence of a very elongated and strange looking uh, source with a size of uh, two and a half million light years. And this is very interesting because when you observe radio emission, you directly know that there must be very energetic particles present uh, in the cluster, um, really with really extreme energies just because you can observe this radio emission. And the big question is basically, how are these particles accelerated? How can you create these really energetic particles um, in, this, in galaxy clusters? 
And uh, to study this process in more detail, we carried out very deep um, radio observations with a very large array in New Mexico, uh, and Chandra observations uh, with the Chandra satellite. Um, roughly, we had uh, three days in total of Chandra observations and uh, two days of continuous uh, observations with a, with a very large array. And uh, these are the two images. So in blue, we have the Chandra image, and in, um, in red, we have the radio image. And this image actually looked very different from a typical cluster. So the X-ray and radio emission looks extremely complex. Um, and this is likely a result of this very complex merger of four different uh, subclusters. We can combine the two images in a nice color uh, composite. So again, here we see the X-ray emission in blue, the radio emission in red. And just a label a few things. So this is actually a four-count radio galaxy, the elongated um, red stripe here. And there's also a radio galaxy to the south here, which is actually falling into the cluster. This is basically radio emission associated with an individual galaxy, with a, basically the black hole of an individual galaxy. What is ever most interesting is that in this region where we observe this very large um, radio structure, we find extremely hot and shocked gas. And this basically directly implies that within the shock, particles are accelerated to extreme uh, energy. So this basically the shocks created during this cluster mergers act as a giant uh, particle accelerator. And how do we now know that this really this is shock gas? And for that we can actually make a, a temperature map of the cluster, just like you can make a can do on Earth, except that the temperatures here are much uh, hotter, so uh, 100 million degrees and hotter. And here, so here we have the temperature map of the cluster, and uh, blue is kind of relatively colder gas is still very hot, but colder gas and red. Um, purple and pink is really hot gas. And what we can see is basically that the radio emission is found in the region where we have this really hot shock heated gas. And a very in interesting implication is that uh, if you have these really large shocks which live for a very long time, like roughly like a billion year, you can basically accelerate particles to energies which are up to a hundred thousand times to a million times higher than what you can do with the, basically the best particle accelerators we have on Earth at the moment. So um, really extreme energies. So to recap here, so we obtained very deep observations of, um, of a very interesting and a very complex merging galaxy clusters. What we find in this cluster is that there is a giant shock wave that basically acts as a particle accelerator. And the properties of this shock imply that uh, these particles can be accelerated to energies much higher than what can be done uh, with particle accelerators on Earth. And with that, I will hand it over to, my, to the next speaker. Uh, Harry Tiplitz. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, I, Thank the WS for uh, allowing me a chance to tell you about uh, the results that I'm presenting in, at the meeting. Um, the title of my uh, project was the Ultraviolet Imaging of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And I want to especially acknowledge uh, some of my, my collaborators, including Mark Rafelski, who is uh, my, a postdoctoral researcher working with me at Caltech. Okay, leading with the big result, uh, we've taken new observations with the Hubble Space Telescope and made uh, a new image of this very famous region of the sky, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which gives us one of the most comprehensive pictures of galaxy evolution ever obtained, and we consider it to be sort of the most colorful picture for this study uh, that we've yet seen. And the reason we want to do this is to study galaxies in what you might call their teenage years, while they're still growing up. So what we did that's new is we took ultraviolet images, and the reason that we want to study things in the ultraviolet is that it tells us about the youngest, most massive, hottest stars that are uh, forming within galaxies. So the ultraviolet, as you know, is blueward of the wavelengths of light that the eye can see. As you can see from the rainbow here, the, if you go blueward, you get the ultraviolet. If you go redward, you get the near infrared, and that's the range that Hubble can see. So looking in the ultraviolet, we see the youngest stars, and we can see them directly when they're not obscured. Uh, and by seeing where, when, and how these stars forms, it formed, it can tell us how galaxies evolved from their very infant stages into the kind of galaxies that we see today. Now, Hubble has been studying this kind of thing for a long time and has been 
getting amazing results looking at infant galaxies in the very distant universe. And Hubble can do that because, because of the, due to the expansion of the universe, UV light is redshifted into the visible and infrared bands that Hubble has already taken. Uh, similarly, with local, for more local galaxies, we can see the UV light directly, and we've seen it for a long time using both Hubble and other satellites like the Galaxy Evolution Explorer Galax. But in between, there has been a gap where we need more UV information. In between sort of five and 10 billion years ago, when UV light was emitted, we've, had a, we've uh, not had the facility to explore that range in the ultraviolet. And so that's what we wanted to fill in the gap. Now, to understand why that's important, it's sort of like having studied people or families by look, first studying uh, infants and then studying grown-ups after they graduate from college, but completely missing everything in between and not knowing about school. So we are trying to fill in that very gap. So how do we do this? We looked at the most famous uh, region of the sky for uh, galaxy evolution studies, which is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is a small patch of sky that Hubble has been studying for uh, more than 10 years now, and all the other facilities, NASA and others, have looked at this region and given us some of the best views ever obtained for uh, studying galaxies, but until now it lacked this UV information. So Hubble's newest camera, the, WIF, the Wide Field Camera 3, has given us the ability to do this. And you can see here one of the very pretty pictures of the astronauts installing WIF C3 uh, on board Hubble. Two years ago, we took the data that I'm going to be, that I'm uh, describing today, but it took a long time for us to fully process which, what is a lot of information. And so we've only just started publishing the results now. And so I'm going to give you a few of the highlights of what we're learning and also a preview of what we hope to learn in the future. So the first thing is that we're able to find these teenage galaxies by looking uh, for them in this multicolor picture. And we can do this with uh, the same technique that's used to find infant galaxies in the very distant universe. And that allows us to get a, an apples to apples comparison of galaxies selected at different times, but in the same way. So we aren't biased by the technique. We can actually study the galaxies. And the, to understand the technique, what you have to remember is that in the ultraviolet, sometimes what you don't see is just as important as what you do see. So if you look at the picture here, uh, this is three of the colors that we have in this uh, multicolor image. When, you, uh, when the galaxies, um, and in this case it's, it's sort of 8 to 11 billion years ago that the UV light was emitted, the very bluest wavelengths are absorbed by neutral hydrogen between us and them. So we don't actually see the bluest wavelengths, but we do see them at the longer wavelengths. So here you see in the UV picture, we aren't seeing some of these galaxies, but we do see them in the blue and the red. And so that's how we find this population of teenage galaxies that we want to study. And in addition, having the multicolor information gives us information about the galaxies themselves. So one of the first papers that we've submitted is studying the, uh, the UV color of these galaxies, which tells us about the content of the galaxies themselves, and we find that more recent galaxies have more dust and more metals. The other thing that we can look at is uh, where within the galaxies these youngest stars are forming. So the distribution of UV light traces the distribution of hot young stars. And by looking at the picture, we can understand how galaxies are evolving into the shapes that they have today. The first thing we did was just look where they were, as you can sort of see in the the cutouts here of a few of the galaxies in the picture. And what we find is that these young stars are forming in groups throughout the entire galaxy, not just concentrated in the middle. And so this was a little surprising because we, weren't, we knew that that was clearly the case in galaxies today, but no one had had these direct uh, pictures of the UV light before to see it in these, very, uh, in these relatively distant teenage galaxies. But now we know that they're lit up by uh, young stars all the way out to the edges. Um, you can see this in the picture because the parts that are blue or that are white where it's mixing the red and, and the blue is where the young stars are, whereas the redder parts is where the old stars are located. And you can see that the blue parts go all the way out to the edge. The next thing that we want to do with um, this data is to look at these little clumps of star formation. You can sort of see in the picture that the the blue parts are not uniformly distributed. They're, the stars form in clumps of, um, of young stars. And where those are and how big those clumps are is going to tell us a lot about how galaxies uh, evolve into the shapes that we see today. The, 
um, the yeah. Uh, finally, I want to uh, just put up the picture again and talk a little bit about why Hubble is important for this. The ultraviolet contribution to this is something that only Hubble can do. In this picture, the blue part of the picture is is the ultraviolet in blue, whereas the green and the red part of the picture that makes the sort of technicolor um, three color image is longer wavelengths. So this is unique to Hubble, th is the blue part here, whereas the next great telescope, the James Webb telescope, will be able to do amazing things at longer wavelengths. It will see much farther, much faster, but only at redder wavelengths. And so on the right, we've, we've emphasized the red part of the picture to, so to show the contrast where the blue is what Hubble is giving us, whereas this picture is what, Hubble, what Webb will be able to do very quickly. And when it puts as much time into a field like this as Hubble has put in, there will be many, many more red things that we can't yet see today. I think that I've hit my seven minutes, so I'll just put up my uh, recap of what I've said. And if you have any questions later in the week, you can reach me or my colleague, um, Roger Winterhorst, with this contact information. All right, and I'd like to hand it over and hear about Great, thank you. I'd, I'd like to uh, first highlight that this, a lot of this work was done by Trevor Dorn Wallenstein, who's an undergraduate at Wesleyan, who's a phenomenal student and will be doing his senior thesis on uh, black hole X-ray binaries in M51, which is a really remarkable thing for an undergraduate. First, a little bit about M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. This is it, a very famous uh, Hubble image. Uh, the distance to M51 is about 23 million light years. Uh, so its size on the sky is, is quite big. It's 7 by 11 minutes. That's like 25% the size of the full moon, which is why Charles Messier could find these things with a telescope that was only a few centimeters across. Uh, in, in reality, it's about 43,000 light years uh, across, which makes uh, the primary galaxy, the, the large galaxy that takes up most of the image, uh, comparable in size to the Milky Way. Where it's different is in its star formation rate. Uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy has a very high star formation rate. It's about seven times the rate of star formation uh, in the Milky Way, and it's due to the interaction with the galaxy that you see at the upper part of the image um, that's triggering this, this star formation in the galaxy. It also has an incredibly high rate of, of supernovas. The rate's about one a decade, uh, which is something like 10 to 100 times the supernova rate in the Milky Way, uh, depending on if you count all supernovae or just massive star supernovae. Um, so this is a Hubble image where the, the blue and green bands are blue and green uh, wide filters, and the red is hydrogen alpha narrow band filter. Um, this is what happens when you add the X-ray on top of that. The X-ray is now in purple from the Chander X-ray Observatory. Uh, for this set of data, we're using 12 observations for a total of 850 kiloseconds, but over 10 days of total exposure time in the X-ray. That makes this the deepest high-resolution exposure of the full disk of any spiral galaxy that's ever been taken uh, in the X-ray. It's really a remarkably rich data set. Uh, and I'm only, only going to talk about a couple of things in it. Uh, within the galaxy itself, there are about 450 X-ray sources. Probably 350 to 400 of them are indigenous to M51. The other 50 to 100 are either foreground sources in the Milky Way or background sources. And as you can see in this image, there's a very strong correlation between the, the fuzzy purple stuff, which is hot gas in the X-ray, and the fuzzy red stuff, which is, uh, which is hydrogen gas that you see in the optical. Both of these are tracing the star formation very actively. You can see it really enhanced in the, that northern arm that approaches the companion galaxy, uh, but several other places as well. And then j this is just the Chandra data uh, by itself, uh, sliced into three different energy slices. Uh, the interesting science result that I want to mention is about black hole binaries. In M51, we see 10 sources uh, that appear to have black holes uh, as, as the X-ray source, and eight of those 10 are associated with active regions of star formation in the galaxy. Uh, they appear to have high mass mass donor stars that are, uh, that are causing uh, accretion onto the black hole. Why this is interesting is because this is a class of objects that essentially doesn't exist in the Milky Way. There's one of these, it's Cygnus X1. Um, and these are uh, uh, evidence of the most massive individual star formation in a galaxy. We're catching them at a very, very short window in their evolutionary cycle. The massive star that formed the black hole has died, 
and the massive star that is accreting material onto the black hole has not yet died. So the, the window in which these things are X-ray bright is really short. It's maybe only tens of thousands of years. Uh, and so they, they really are excellent tracers of active, incredibly massive star formation in a galaxy. This is just blowing up the central region of this to give you an idea of the richness of this Chandra data. You can see very fine structure in the diffuse emission that traces the spiral arms. You can see a massive ring of, of hot gas that's ejected from the nucleus at the center of the galaxy. Uh, and then you can see a couple hundred X-ray point sources in this image. Uh, so we see these 10 sources that are probably stellar mass black holes. Eight of the 10 are coincident with star formation. That's a very, very high number. These are each individually really interesting sources. And we can study them over a very long baseline of Chandra observations covering a bit more than 12 years. Uh, another interesting result to do with those sources is that there was previous uh, research done using data from the XMM Newton telescope that suggested that at least three of these eight sources were intermediate mass black holes with masses in the range of a few thousand solar masses. Our Chandra data can all but conclusively uh, rule that out. Uh, these all appear to be stellar mass black holes of the sort that we see in the Milky Way, uh, but with a different mass donor type. Uh, there's one transient source that I'm not going to talk about, but it's interesting for its own reason. And the full catalog of 460 sor point sources is being processed now. I have a team of undergraduate students cranking away this summer. And all of this data will be public publicly available to you very soon. We're publishing on Authoria. Uh, so all of the changes that we're making to the data in real time and the papers in real time is available to you by the end of this meeting. Thank you. Hello, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Um, today I'm reporting um, some results on the uh, cosmic evolution of two classes of um, gamma ray producing galaxies, um, so called blazers, um, that are different, but people and scientists suspected that there was a link between them for a very long time. We finally found evidence that this link indeed exists. Um, it's probably um, the Evan engine which is probably able to operate under two different conditions. One condition is a gas fueling, gas guzzling phase, basically produces radiation thanks to the gas uh, which is surrounding the uh, supermassive black hole. At the same time, uh, this process actually makes the black hole spinning really fast. And then eventually when the gas has finished, uh, has been exhausted, then the, the system can go on just tapping on the energy um, which is saved in the rotating black hole, in the spinning black hole. And this can be seen on this graph here, which shows on the y-axis the density of sources for these two classes of objects. Uh, this density is the number of objects per volume. On the x-axis, there is redshift from 0 to 3.5, which is also like look back time. So redshift of 0 is today, and 3.5 will be almost 12 billion years ago. So if you look at from the right, these are the two different classes. So we have uh, uh, the gas-fueled objects. Uh, these guys, they are increasing their density as basically time proceeds. Uh, and then eventually, uh, gas is running out, um, and they disappear. They don't shine anymore. Uh, exactly at the point where they are running out of fuel, there is this other source class, um, the one that's tapping on the energy uh, saved in the black hole, which is actually uh, turning on and increasing their number density, um, their number density. Uh, really quickly. And this happened roughly 5.6 uh, uh, billion years ago. Um, and the last, uh, the last to the present age. Um, let me make a step back and tell you what are blazers. Blazers are um, galaxies hosting a massive black hole which is able to accelerate particles to near the speed of light. And uh, they launch collimated jets um, of um, with an angle of one degree or so, or very few degrees. Normally, we refer to blazers when we are looking on axis uh, or very close to the axis of these objects, and it's like looking down the uh, barrel of a gun. So you're seeing very variable emission and very luminous emission as well. Um, these objects uh, come normally in two flavors. Uh, and this is on slide four. Uh, on the flash spectrum radio quasar flavor and the BLAC or BLACERTE object flavor. And these has, are different as uh, an old Mustang and, and a new Tesla Roadster can be. Um, the flash spectrum radio quasar are, are the gas guzzling guys. So these are powerful, like the Mustang, powerful. They use gas. Uh, they use it all very quickly. 
Uh, they don't last very long, and they don't have very good mileage. Plus, spectral quasars don't make it, as you have seen in, uh, to the present age, so to the local universe. We don't see them. We don't see so many around us. And they are not even that fast, uh, like the old Mustangs, despite they are beautiful. Um, the Tesla Roadster, or the BLX, on the other hand, they use the energy which has been saved on their, on their battery. They have very good mileage, uh, as long as the battery has been charged. Uh, and they accelerate really fast, like BLX too. BLX are the best accelerators that we know of in the universe, very likely. Um, the link that we suspect is uh, depicted here in uh, figure five, in slide number five. Um, when the universe was young, um, um, galaxies were rich with gas and often got together in a big merging event, which uh, dislodged the gas around thanks to the tidal forces and allowed the gas to reach the center part of the um, of the galaxy where there is the supermassive black hole. They started an accretion process and eventually we got into the gas scuttling phase where the, there is a flat spectral radio quasar which shines brightly only for a very short amount of time, uh, a giga year or so, or even less. We are left with a um, um, gas poor elliptical galaxy but there is a supermassive black hole spinning fast around it which can still power jets for a very long time, accreting very, very little matter. Um, this is basically um, what happens so uh, in slide number six, during the uh, flux spectrum radio quasar phase, um, the gas is not only powering clearly uh, the entire system, but it's also charging uh, this, the, the battery, which will be the, uh, it's putting, uh, spinning up the black hole. And this is what, at the end, uh, is the energy that's extracted in the BLAC phase for a very long time. Um, the slide number seven shows uh, a little movie of how we think this transition is going on. So this will be a flux spectrum radio quasar, eventually the gas uh, uh, has been depleted, has been um, exhausted completely, and you are left with a, um, uh, with a naked object, so with a BLAC, which has no gas or not very much gas around it. Um, these results uh, were made possible thanks uh, uh, to Fermi, who surveyed the entire sky and is still doing it, detected um, um, more than a thousand blazers all across the sky and uh, also very distant from us. But the important thing in this uh, business is actually to get a precise ratio measurement, which is very difficult for some of these objects. And uh, this was made possible thanks to many collaborators who use many telescopes nights on telescopes all across um, the globe for several years. Um, slide, uh, the last slide, slide number uh, nine, summarizes our results. We found evidence that there is a, a link between the two classes of uh, blazers. This link has been suspected for quite some time, and this is the first evidence uh, that uh, indeed the, uh, it exists. So we believe that there is, uh, uh, they have a common engine which is able of two modes of operation. Uh, one of them uh, is using gas to power the entire system, and the other one taps in the energy which has been saved during the previous phase in the battery. So um, early on in the universe, it was time when uh, you know, gas was abundant in the universe and uh, um, uh, systems were using a lot of gas. Nowadays, uh, uh, redshift zero, today, uh, gas uh, became more expensive. Uh, it's not very common anymore. And uh, uh, it's the time of the electric cars or uh, the battery fuel, the blazers. But there is this time here, uh, around redshift 0 0.6, 5.6 billion years ago, where both systems seem to be very common. This is the era of the hybrid engines. And uh, um, let me just say that Fermi is continuing uh, um, the survey of the entire gamma sky, and CTA will soon come online. CTA is the next uh, um, Cherkov telescope array. And it will be important to measure both to find, uh, with more accuracy, uh, um, systems, both a low redshift and a larger redshift, uh, to uh, improve these results even further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our four speakers, Reinhard van Veren, Harry Teplitz, Roy Kelgard, and Marco Argello. Uh, before we go on, I would like to mention that there are four press releases that have been issues, uh, issued in connection with this, one from NRAO, one from ESA, one from STSCI, and one from Chandra. Uh, now we start the question and answer. Please, if you have a question, Wait for the microphone and speak in the microphone, and please identify yourself by name and affiliation. Uh, 
Uh, Martin Ratcliffe, freelance uh, for Reinhardt. The uh, energies of those particles you have, 10 to the 18, 10 to the 19, are remarkably close to extra, the ultra high energy cosmic rays. Is there any link? A uh, very good question. So uh, there could indeed be a link. Um, we are, however, not really sure about that. Um, one of the problems is that um, these extremely high energy particles where you're talking about, so 10 to the 19, 10 to the 20 AV, um, they can only travel a certain distance uh, to us. So they need to come from nearby clusters. Now, there are some nearby clusters um, close enough, for example, the Coma Cluster, which is actually undergoing a merger and is also probably has a shock. Um, so that could indeed uh, explain maybe some of the origin of these extremely high uh, energetic cosmic rays. And uh, the energies I mentioned are for protons. If you have uh, heavier nuclei, you can actually uh, accelerate to energies of 10 to the 20, 10 to the 21, which has been observed at the Earth. But it has to come from very nearby clusters. Um. Any further questions? Yep, there's one from Steve. Steve Marin, freelance for Marco. Uh, you refer to the uh, jets and the recycled flat spectrum radio quasars or BLX as being powered uh, by energy extracted from the spin of the supermassive black hole. Does that mean that you, the black hole rotation rate should actually be decreasing? Yeah, it's expected that eventually uh, the black hole should spin down slowly, uh, but these are processes that can last a very long time, uh, probably comparable to the age of the universe. So, it's and that it's doesn't violate any GR yeah, or anything. No. Okay. Any other questions in the room? Yeah. Hi, Irene Klotz with the Discovery Channel um, for Dr. Tiplitz. Is the um, uh, are the LV um, UV Observations still underway, or are they now finished for this ultra deep field? The the observations of this one field are completed. Uh, Hubble is currently taking uh, a lot of UV observations of many different things, and has encouraging people when they write proposals for the telescope to consider using UV while the capability is still there. So we hope that there will be many more observations like this for wider fields where we see many more galaxies than we've seen so far in this really great first example. Is the lifetime limitation Hang on, let's wait for the mic. Thanks. Yeah. Is the lifetime limitation just the uh, end of Hubble life? Yeah, Hubble is currently the last telescope that will be able to do this. Okay. We had a question down here. And meanwhile, I would like to remind the uh, uh, folks watching us on the webcast, if you have questions, please send them via text chat. Hi, Clara Moskowitz with Scientific American. Question for Dr. Van Weeren. Can you talk a little bit more about the mechanism that you suspect is behind the acceleration? So I understand you have this, this shock during the collision. It, the gas gets heated up, but then what? Uh, so actually, uh, we know a bit more about this mechanism. So this is called actually shock acceleration. And this is also, for example, uh, observed in supernova remnants. Um, so it's actually a pretty well-known process um, and so as soon as you have a shock with a high enough Mach number, so a strong enough shock, um, it's ha it has been known for quite a long time that you can accelerate particles. Um, one um, special thing about clusters is that the properties of the shocks in clusters are a bit different than, for example, in supernova remnants. Um, that part of the theory is still not properly understood. But the fact that we see these very energetic particles basically directly tells us they have to be, have to be accelerated somewhere. They cannot come from nothing because the, the energies are so extreme. Um, so it's a, it's a known process, but it's uh, so far mainly been observed in supernova remnants. Okay. Do we have any other questions in the room? Any questions on the web? Yep. Oh, I have my own mic. Uh, this is actually a question from me, uh, Rick Feinberg, AAS press officer. For Dr. Kilgard, uh, you mentioned that the Chandra data very conclusively rule out the possibility that many of these sources were intermediate mass black holes. I'm just curious if you can elaborate on, on how it is that you can determine that. Is it done from their, you know, from their brightness or from their energy spectrum or from their variability or, or what? Uh, a little of all of the above. It's, it's largely the X-ray spectral state that they're in. We, uh, we can do a very good job of fitting just the source locally in a way that XMM can't do. The problem with the XMM data is that the XMM point spread function is 
15 times or, or so the size of Chandra's point spread function, and there's a lot of confusion uh, in the data. And, and the paper actually did an excellent job of trying to, to rule out uh, cross-contamination, but uh, not quite good enough for a couple of these sources. And, uh, and the, with the particular state that these sources are in, over a decade of Chandra observation and observing spectral state changes in a couple of the sources, we can pretty, uh, pretty conclusively rule out that they're intermediate mass black holes. They're doing what stellar mass black holes do in the Milky Way. Okay, any other questions? Nothing from the web? Okay, well then I would like to thank our speakers again and thank all of you uh, for coming here and listening to us. The next uh, press conference will be tomorrow at 10.15 right here. It will talk on an astronomical assortment of phenomena uh, going from news from Sophia to type 1a supernovae to star formation to monster galaxies. And tomorrow afternoon at 2.15 p.m., also right here, will be a seminar for science writers, the expanding universe of shrinking satellites, with speakers Alexander Antunes, Garrett Jernigan, and Lynn Kaminsky. So I will hope to see you all here again tomorrow. Thank you.